So we've been talking about the gentle invitations of Jesus, a series of talks, especially for women, based on the fact that God created us male and female. His image can only fully be expressed in two genders, alike in many ways, and yet different in many ways. And as we serve him together, he is honored. The system that he'd created got messed up in the Garden of Eden, and every culture since has struggled to know what to do with gender and gender difference and gender power. But Jesus has never given up on his design. And so we've been talking first to the ladies, and in a week, starting with the men, about how we can serve God together. Ladies, Jesus, in our series of talks, uh, reminded you that Jesus asked first for your heart, that you would accept him as Lord and Savior. And then he also invites you to give him his heartaches, your heartaches, rather, and to, to just cast those burdens on him. And then we talked about his invitation to give you his, uh, your anxieties and fears. He knows when you're afraid and what you're afraid of, and he wants to carry that burden for you. And last time together, we talked about his invitation to you to give him your home. Uh, now, you understand, because we reviewed it, that a house is a building, but a home, that's about relationships. And so if you're married, it's to give him your relationship with your husband. If you have children, to give him your relationship with your children. If you are a person serving the Lord as a single right now, is to give him the closest relationships of your life. Will you give me your home? And when we do, he gives it back to us in a brand new light. This, this last installment of this series is not the last invitation of Jesus. His word is filled with truth. His word is filled with encouragement. His word is filled with invitations <laughs> to trust him. But today, we're going to talk for the moments, these moments together about an invitation of a different kind. It's an invitation that invites you to give to him your hopes and your dreams, your future, the inner part of your heart that maybe nobody else even knows about except the Lord. Jesus asks you, may I have your hopes, may I have your dreams. Will you entrust those to me? We're going to take a look uh, in preparation for our thoughts at two places in the Bible. Uh, first, the book of Psalms. If you're new to the study of the Bible, it's kind of handy. It's just about exactly in the center of the Bible as it's printed. Uh, Psalm 25, I'm going to read from there. And then a second uh, selection is going to be from towards the end of the Bible, the book of Romans, Romans and chapter 5. So Psalm 25, Roman 5. <clears throat> David is writing... And I'm going to read the first five verses of Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me for you are my God, you are, you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. And then from the book of Romans, much later in the Bible, and centuries later in time, Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writing here. And he's writing about some great stuff. There's several sermons here. We're just going to lift some truth for this one. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. There it is again, hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given to us. Hope. It was uh, April 11th, 2009. There's no reason that you should recall that, but some of you will recall what I'm going to introduce in a moment. 
<clears throat> when a 47-year-old single lady from Blackburn, West Lothian, Scotland, it's about 20 miles west of Edinburgh, walked out on a stage to enter the next level of competition in a program entitled Britain's Got Talent. At first glance, and some of you are aware of this, she seemed an unlikely candidate for success on stage, rather plain looking, an unruly mop of dark curls, and a not so memorable outfit. Her father, Patrick, was a miner and a veteran of the Second World War. Her mother, Bridget, was a shorthand typist. Born when her mother was 45 years old, Susan was the youngest of four brothers and five sisters. She was raised thinking that she'd been briefly deprived of oxygen during her very difficult delivery, resulting in a learning disability. However, she found out later she was misdiagnosed and she has Asperger syndrome. She was bullied as a child, <clears throat> and as sometimes will happen in this world, she received a disparaging nickname at school. They called her Susie Simple all during her school years. After leaving school with few qualifications, <clears throat> she was employed for the only time in her life as a trainee cook in the kitchen of West Lothian College for six months. That's her whole employment career, six months. And took part in government training programs and did a little singing at local venues. And she tried out unsuccessfully many times for a number of parts that involved singing on stage. And every time they said, sorry, Susan. Well, her father died in the 1990s. Her siblings had left home. She never married, and she dedicated herself to caring for her aging mother until her death in 2007, her mother's death in 2007, at the age of 91. <laughs> and it was her mother that, before she died, told Susan that she ought to try out for Britain's Got Talent. Really, Mom? Your daughter said, never had a successful audition for anything. Her vocal resume, resume total resume reads, well, I tried out for a lot of stuff and didn't get chosen, but I do sing at church. A neighbor reported that when Bridget, Susan's mom, passed away, that Susan wouldn't come out for three or four days or answer her door or her phone. And I understand that. Some of you understand that, why that would be true. She continued to sing periodically with her church choir, and she was an active volunteer at her church visiting the elderly. It reveals her heart, you know. She'd take, take taken care of her mom, and she took care of elderly in the congregation, in their homes. <clears throat> and she described her life as mundane and routine. And so this rather plain-looking 47-year-old single lady makes her way out on this large stage with really only three things going for her. She had an ability. She could sing. She had a bit of courage. Some might call it faith. And she had a hope. She had a hope. She had a dream. She called it a dream. To become a professional singer. Many of you have tuned in to that moment in subsequent years. The music starts and Susan Boyle sang this song with some very painful lyrics. I think it was in some ways autobiographical. I think she was singing about her own journey. Let me, let me give you, remind you the lyrics. Some of you have not perhaps heard it. But here are the lyrics uh, to the song uh, taken from a famous musical. Here, here we go. Here's what she sung. <laughs> I dreamed a dream in times gone by when hope was high and life worth living. I dreamed that love would never die. I dreamed that God would be forgiving. Then <laughs> I was young and unafraid. And dreams were made and used and wasted. There was no ransom to be paid, no song unsung, no wine untasted. But the tigers come at night with their voices soft as thunder as they tear your hopes apart, <clears throat> as they turn your dream to shame. And still, I dream he'll come to me, that we will live the years together, but there are dreams that cannot be. There are storms we cannot weather. 
I had a dream my life would be so different from this hell I'm living. So different now from what it seems. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. Wow. So here's a question that you don't need to answer to me, but reflect on. Did you ever feel like that, sort of? Ever quietly say to yourself, what's the point? It will never happen anyway. <laughs> Why even dream? Why have hopes when everything seems so hopeless? Ever feel like the weight and pressures of life and the choices that you've made that cannot be unmade, the trials that have come, the opportunities that have been missed have torn your hopes apart and turned your dream <laughs> to shame? Ever feel like life has killed the dream you dreamed? Well, if you've ever felt that way, or perhaps if you're feeling that way now, you need to know a couple of things. One is you've got a lot of company. Life in a fallen world often produces this sentiment. It's a common despair. And the enemy of our souls as believers, Satan, would have us stop dreaming. He would have us live without hope, if he can. Would have us spend our days in sadness over what might have been the voice of our inner regret echoing over and over and over in our own heads, in our own hearts. Well, it's too late. The dream is dead. God has abandoned me. I'm going to stop having hopes. It is, in the end, hopeless. And I'd like to suggest, ladies, that no one feels the pain of the death of a dream more deeply than a sensitive heart of a woman. Now, both men and women go through this experience, but God has equipped you as a woman of grace with tremendous sensitivity. It's an amazing thing. But the difficulty of having that great sensitivity is that you feel this very deeply. And perhaps it's a pain that no one knows about except you and God because no one knew about the dream. And those inner voices may be so loud that we fail to hear a gentle invitation of a different voice. Of course, the voice of Jesus saying, may I have your dreams? Would you give me your hopes? Would you be willing to release those hopes and dreams to me? Can I take possession of your concept of your own future? Would you trust me with you, including those dreams. Would you do that? In the Bible, there are examples of what happens, many dramatic examples of what happens when God takes possession of our hopes and dreams. And I want to share with you this morning just a handful of those, and we'll talk a little bit more <laughs> about them. Let's begin with Sarah. These are all examples. Happened to men, it happened to us as well, but these are all women. Let's start with Sarah, the wife of Abraham. You can read about her in Genesis 12 and on. She longed, among other things, she longed deeply for a child. That was her hope. That was her dream. Uh, she followed her husband when God told him to leave everything behind and become nomads. I can only imagine. Let me give you the quote from Genesis 12, and then let's talk about it a little bit. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, end quote. And we celebrate Abram's faith, and we forget about Sarah's. And I'm segueing over to that conversation. So he comes home for dinner. Honey, I had an interesting experience today. Oh, what, dear? What was it? Oh, God spoke to me. Really? Really? Yeah. What did he say? Well, he said that we should uh, sell the businesses, uh, leave our home, sell everything that we have, uh, leave this city, and, uh, and go. Oh, go where? Well, I don't know. Um, and what are we going to do there? I, I don't know that either. Um, but we get, the good news, we, we get to tent. We get to camp out every day. <laughs> not making this up as I go, but you get the exchange. You get the, you get the notion of this. I mean, we need to celebrate Sarah's faith. She followed. 
She said yes to that proposition because of her sense that God was in it. Where are we going? Don't know. What are we going to do? Don't know. Where are we going to live? In a tent. And so they did. The Bible records quite a lot of detail, but the Bible also leaves some things blank. Although there were signs of God's blessing, there were decades, decades of silence from God, and there was never, ever a child. Along the way, her husband, Abram, did some dumb things. In one case, uh, she was really beautiful. Um, he lied to protect himself about who she was. He said, well, she's my sister. It's a long story. But she ended up for a brief time in Pharaoh's harem. How's that? God protected her, thankfully, ladies, and uh, rescued her from that, but still no child. She eventually got desperate, and she uh, gave her, her handmaiden to her husband as a concubine. Now, that's extremely shocking. God does not endorse that, but it's less shocking in their day than in ours. That was a sort of a custom, not a God-sponsored custom. But So she did that. <laughs> they said, well, my servant girl's going to have a baby, and that'll be my baby under, under the authority of the household. Well, the result was a relational disaster. Ishmael was born, that's true, but there was no real child of the heart for Sarah, and Ishmael's mother became uh, condescending. It was, a, it was a mess. And finally, <clears throat> life killed the dream. She's very old, and there is still no child, and now there is no hope of a child. Now, if you've read the story, you know it's at this point that God shows up. He breaks the silence with an extraordinary announcement. He said, good news, Abraham, you and your wife are going to have a baby. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Abraham objects, and Sarah laughs. Now, she hid behind a tent to laugh, but she laughed. All right? And Abraham scoffs, and the Bible records his response. Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And the answer is, of course she won't have a baby at the age of 90. How ridiculous is that? Turns out she didn't have a child at the age of 90. She had a child at the age of 91. <laughs> God writes the final chapter concerning the dreams that we entrust to him. Let's take a second, lady. Hannah happens to be a similar dream, and not all of these have the same dream attached, but Hannah was childless in a culture in which everything revolved around that honor in the life of a woman. First Samuel 2 in the Bible records it. She prayed for years for a child. Uh, my wife and I shared something of that journey. We prayed for years for a child. Ultimately, Hannah gave that hope to the Lord. <laughs> the baby's name was Samuel. And I think, I like to think that years later, Hannah would have recalled that time of loneliness and hopelessness and despair as she just prayed, hoping that God was listening. I'd like to think she recalled that as she set the table for her husband, Elkanah, and for Samuel's three brothers and two sisters. Six babies. Six babies. Ruth. You can find that in the Bible in the book of her name, Ruth. It's in the index there for you if you're new to the study of the Bible. Ruth. She was a young widow, a foreigner taking care of an aging mother-in-law, and neither of them had enough money to eat. Are we having fun yet? Very hungry, penniless, in the grocery line, no money. What's more, her mother-in-law, whom Ruth uh, loved and had pledged herself to take care of, was not an easy person to take care of. She too had suffered loss. Ruth widowed in young age, her mother-in-law widowed, and uh, if you read the Bible carefully, her personality was probably less than stellar. When they got back to their own country, her mother-in-law said, you can call me by a different name. You can call me bitter. And I'm thinking, 
taking care of her might have been tough. And then the God of all hope intervened. And a few years later, I like to imagine Ruth giving direction to her staff on the grounds of her husband Boaz's estate while her mother-in-law Naomi did a little child care for the baby. They named him Obed. What you may not be aware of or may have forgotten is that Ruth's great-grandson is known to many of us. That was King David of Israel. King David of Israel. Esther is another great woman of faith that appears in the record of the scriptures, God's word. It's also in the book by her name, Esther. An orphan in captivity under a plot to kill all of her people. It was hopeless. God shows up. She became queen of Persia, and God used her to save her people. In the New Testament, we've recently celebrated them, Mary and Martha, the sisters, and their brother Lazarus. In that culture, in that day, loved ones, you had to be connected, if at all possible, in some way to a man. Now, you didn't have to be married, but you had to have someone, a father, a brother, someone who would take you in because there was no safety net socially. And the guys were the providers and protectors, <laughs> good or bad, gentlemen, sometimes both. So these two sisters are suddenly left without support. Their brother, whom they loved, dies. And we've shared this before. I've talked with you before. You don't get much more hopeless than that, eh? The funeral is over. Some lingering mourning occurs. He's in the grave. And again, I like to think about this in the world of my imagination. I suspect that the girls often talked about that dark time in later years as they ate supper with Lazarus. Please pass the lamb hot dish. Uh, would you mind telling us again how it was to be dead for four days? If you're not familiar with the story, Jesus showed up. And he had a plan. It's a wonderful story to read. And his plan was including giving life for those that are dead. Lazarus, come forth. He came back home. Came out of the grave. All these stories and more some spectacular in nature, some very modest, but God restoring the dream, God restoring hope. I mentioned it a moment ago. Ruth's great-grandson, David, he wrote about his own heart. And as he writes, he says this, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul, in you I trust, O oh my God, do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my tri enemies triumph over me. We read this a few moments ago. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. Show me your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are, my God, you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. End quote. Where do you think he learned that? He wrote a lot of the Psalms as a reasonably young person. And I know that he learned it partly from personal experience that it's right to hope in the Lord. But I'm pretty certain that he learned part of that in his family legacy as his parents talked to him about his great-grandmother. Let me tell you, David, about your great-grandmother. She's a foreigner, penniless, no hope, had no idea what the next day would bring. Let me tell you again her story. And about your grandfather, Obed. Ladies, you entrust your hopes to the Lord. You live that out. And not only change your life, it'll change the generations that follow you. Shared with folk in the service that gathered earlier. And afterwards, some folk came up and talked about the legacy that their grandmother, their mother, their great-grandmother prayed for them. One person said, I, I grew up in, in the midst of all kinds of sin, but there were two. My grandmother and one aunt knew Jesus. And finally, so did we all in our family. 
That same David, Ruth's great-grandson, pointed others to the same assurance. It wasn't just about him saying, I, my hope is in the Lord. He said this. Let me give you some addresses along the way. He said this, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Psalm 31, 24. He said, he wrote, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. That's Psalm 33, 18. He wrote, the Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. That's Psalm 147, 11. The same Jesus spoke with power through the prophet Jeremiah to the people of Israel, to other followers of God, and to you and me. And many of you are familiar with the verse that I'm going to share with you now. Jeremiah 29, 11. Some of you are already starting it in your minds. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And no less a patriarch than Job, at the very depth of hopeless circumstances. You know this scenario, many of you. Failing health, businesses had been dynamited. They're gone. And he's in sight of ten fresh graves that hold the bodies of all of his children. And from that ash heap, he says this, even though he slay me, even if God kills me, yet I will hope in him. I will trust, entrust my dreams, if you will, my future, my hope to him. Finally, centuries later, a redeemed sinner, that's the only kind there are, who had overseen the killing of Christians and lost every single benefit of his formerly prosperous life, wrote a letter to Jesus' followers in Rome. I read an excerpt for you. Let me say it and read it again. Romans 5. This is the Apostle Paul. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We're going to heaven. Not only so, but we rejoice even in sufferings because we know that our suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, more hope. I added the more there. Hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Loved ones, our dreams and our hopes are safe in Jesus. You all know that not every hope and dream will be fulfilled in exactly the way we envision it and exactly on our time frame. God doesn't sign off on that, but he invites you to share, ladies, your hopes and dreams with him, even the secret ones of your deep heart, with the knowledge that he will take each one of those as a treasure and he will give back to you either the fulfillment of that specific dream or something better. How's that? Something, as you look back from eternity, realizing the hope that you have in him, you will be grateful for. And so keep on, keeping on, keeping on trusting him. And so, Susan Boyle finished her song, hoping against hope that at long last, at age 47, with Asperger's syndrome, having spent the heart of her life in singleness, taking care of an aging parent, possessing a long-harbored and highly unlikely, highly unlikely dream to become a professional singer, that she might, at long last, be given a chance. Mom said, Susan, why don't you try? Here comes the good part. Her first album, I Dreamed a Dream, was released in November 2009 and became the United Kingdom's best-selling debut album of all time. It outsold the rest of the top five albums combined in its first week. It topped the Billboard chart for six straight weeks and narrowly failed to become the best-selling album of 2009 in the world. She was beat out here in the United States by Taylor Swift, who has another story. Six of Susan's subsequent albums made the top 20 
in the charts of the United Kingdom and the U.S. Uh, she was struggling to pay her bills in 2009. By 2012, her estimated net worth was 22 million pounds. You can get groceries with that. She's known for supporting various charitable causes. As of 2013, she had sold 19 million albums worldwide and received two Grammy nominations. In July of 2014, she carried the Queen's Baton. Now, that's not a big deal to us, but in the United Kingdom, that's a big deal. The Queen's Baton for the 2014 Commonwealth Games, which would be held at Glasgow, Scotland, and performed at the opening ceremony in front of the Queen. And later, characteristic of her heart, I think, she took the baton to show the children in one of the wards at the York Hill Royal Hospital for sick children. As of November 2014, Susan was dating her first boyfriend, whom she described as about the same age as me. I checked before I came into this service uh, that 2009 episode, many of you have seen it on YouTube, currently has just north of 207 million views. A lot of people have been encouraged by Susan's story. Now, almost done. I'm not certain... Uh, about where Susan Boyle is on her journey of faith. She is a devout Catholic in Scotland. But I wanted to take the time to share her example with you because it reminds us, if we follow Jesus, of a biblical reality that Susan may not even have been aware of in 2009. And the reality is this, that the God who made us and loves us is aware of our dreams. The Jesus who died in our place on the cross knows the deepest desires of our hearts, and he knows your deepest desire as a woman. And to every woman who has given up hope or is about to give up hope that her hopes and dreams could ever come true comes a gentle invitation. It's the same still small voice of the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus speaking. May I have your hopes? Would you be willing to give those to me, the, the, those secret ones too, the hopes and dreams of your heart? Would you entrust those to me? Would you be willing to trust me and see what I can do with what you and maybe everybody else has determined to be hopeless? Would you be willing to, to test me in that and see what I can do with that which man regards as hopeless? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. The invitation, ladies, is this. Entrust the hopes and dreams of your heart, even the ones that seem hopeless, maybe especially the ones that seem hopeless, to Jesus. And then wait and see what he will do with that which you've entrusted to him. Begin now as we pray. Let's bow in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being a God of our hopes and dreams. I pray again that you would wrap your arms of love around every woman listening to this talk, that you would give her in her heart of hearts the assurance that you made her, that you love her, that you know her dreams and her hopes, and that they count with you. Give her a new sense of encouragement and courage to take a very difficult step, and that is to give to you, Lord, all those hopes and dreams, to give you to you the concept of the future, to give to you those things that sometime we all are afraid will die and pass away without fulfillment, just to transfer all of that to you. And then I ask, Lord, in your name, that with power and might, in the perfect time and in just the right way, you would meet the deepest needs of the heart. Sometimes that'll mean the dream comes true. Sometimes it'll mean something else, something different, something eternally better will happen. But in all cases, we will know that it's been you, Lord, who's been at work. Into your hands, we commit ourselves, our hopes, our dreams, and all the women whom we love and whom you love. And we pray to your glory and to our hope in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.